so thanks everybody for joining. Um, this is my third All Things Open. Actually, I'm a big fan of uh, this show as well as the uh, related Open Source 101. And this is the second time that I've delivered uh, this presentation at an All Things Open. So thank you for the uh, encore opportunity. I did uh, I did give it a fresh coat of paint. It's not exactly the uh, the same presentation that we delivered last time. Uh, but it, it kind of the spirit of it has definitely remained the same. It is very much a one-on-one talk uh, for kind of Linux beginners, people who may be interested uh, in getting into the operating system and maybe uh, don't really know where to start or kind of want uh, some more ideas, kind of how the, the theory of, of the operating system itself. So let's let's just dive right into it. <clears throat> um, I'm on full screen, so I probably can't see your questions uh, in the Zoom, but I will try to take some time to go and view them in the chat uh, after we get through this. Uh, a little bit about me. I am the chief architect at uh, Open Logic. My name is Justin Riach. I've been uh, working in various software roles for a little over 20 years at this point. Um, focused on a lot of different things actually throughout my career. Spent a long time working uh, alongside enterprise integration work. Uh, did a lot with like messaging stuff, ActiveMQ, Camel, that kind of thing. I have a, a number of talks on that. Uh, nowadays, I really mostly, you know, do evangelism of our own open logic product, uh, as well as uh, this type of thing, a lot of uh, public speaking, I really enjoy uh, kind of evangelizing individual free software products uh, that I've worked with and that I've uh, helped my customers uh, uh, use and consume in the past. And so this is kind of what I do. So I have to say, you know, this is probably my uh, fourth or fifth virtual event this year. And, and and, and thanks everybody for, first of all, for, for putting these on. Thanks, all things open. We, we recently hosted our own event. I know that, that this is, it's hard, right? It's hard to get the engagement. It's hard to, to know how the platform is gonna perform. Uh, this seems to be going really well. I've seen a lot of engagement. So, um, you know, just as, as a person who does a lot of this kind of thing and a lot of the public speaking and a lot of these types of events, uh, thank you, all things open. Congratulations, the event seems to be going really well. I hope everybody's enjoying it and thank you for, everyone's patience and, and kind of bearing with all of us as we kind of uh, try to try our best to, to, to be a community on, on sort of this new new format where we're all kind of persisting. So, okay, enough with that. If you if you feel like adding me on LinkedIn, feel free. I'm pretty open to that. I'll, I'll definitely accept your request. Um, all right, let's just dive into it. Uh, well, before we do that, small plug, the company I work for is OpenLogic. Uh, we help uh, enterprises uh, adopt free software in a number of different ways. Uh, and so really it's just related to this because I've had exposure to enterprise Linux uh, running within a bunch of different use cases. A lot of our customers are Fortune 100, Fortune 500. So, you know, we've really seen free software and Linux at scale. Uh, and that's kind of what we do. And that's the closest thing you get uh, to a sales pitch for me for the rest of the talk, I promise. All right. Uh, before we can really look at the origins of Linux, we need to take a bit of a look at the history of Unix, uh, which is the type of operating system that Linux was sort of modeled after. Okay, uh, So this was uh, invented at Bell Labs, uh, and it was uh, back then it was used for, you know, big, um, <laughs> you know, like closet size mainframe machines and stuff like that. Um, uh, and it was uh, a useful operating system. Uh, it was really close to the hardware, uh, and it ended up splitting into what would become BSD Unix from the Berkeley Software uh, Foundation, uh, which would then split into like SunOS um, and uh, the Server 5 Linux, HPUX, and all this. These were all commercial variants of Unix that were used kind of in the, uh, the earlier days of doing this type of computing. Uh, and, uh, you know, alongside this, you had uh, the Free Software Foundation and the GNU project, uh, which was, you know, kind of this foundation that was trying to push uh, free software. And they hesitate to even call it open source, as you'll see, uh, they, they truly mean free, no DRM, no licenses, except for the GPL license, everything has to be copyleft, uh, truly free, free software. I'm a big fan of this foundation, by the way. And they are the foundation that would uh, kind of grow to sponsor uh, Linux as we know it today. So, but as you can see, I mean, Unix has branched out into all of these recognizable forms even even now and i should probably extend this timeline a little bit but you know ios on your iphone android on your android phone all of these things find their roots in early bell labs unix right it really comes from there uh here's a, a system 5 hp ux machine um or hp commercial uh, unix machine but for anybody who's booted linux before uh this doesn't look too far from from what you see now in a, in a typical boot screen okay 
Uh, so Linux then uh, versus Unix, well, where did it split off? Well, um, you know, in, in early days of free software, um, you know, circa early 90s, um, you know, you had a lot of these hobbyist forums, Unix hobbyist forums and stuff like that. Um, and you had uh, this guy, uh, Linus Torvald, uh, who was going to push a little hobbyist uh, version of, of Unix, um, uh, uh, he called Minix at the time, a small stripped down version of Unix. He was going to push a little fork of it and, and called it Linux. And it was just a hobby project. It wasn't ever really supposed to be a big deal. Um, but of course, as we know, it became the biggest operating system and possibly the most disruptive force uh, in software uh, as we know it. And certainly, I think the uh, the most successful free software story ever told. And so it began with this hobby project. Uh, and then it just kind of grew. You had people forking it, uh, you know, kind of early understanding of community software and the power of open source and free software. You, you know, you had a uh, the, the Debian fork become, you know, really a, a, a separate flavor of Linux. And we'll talk about what flavor means in a second um, that, you know, kind of uh, became its own brand. And then, you know, shortly thereafter, you had Red Hat, who was already a software company, a, a company that was uh, to, for, for those of you who want a little trivia back then, uh, were running a software catalog magazine that you could buy in software in on store shelves. And it had a a disc on it, a CD, and the CD was loaded with with open source, and that was you know Red Hat's early distribution model was through a catalog, and then they kind of seized onto Linux and 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 started working on enterprise Linux, and you know really uh, really started disrupting a lot of these big uh, server uh, operating systems, enterprise class server operating systems, and it grew it grew pretty quickly. Um, you know you. Uh, you, you see IBM investing a billion dollars in Linux. Uh, obviously, uh, big more recent news uh, with IBM and, and its its uh, strategies towards Linux happening uh, in the IBM ac uh, acquisition. But but IBM's investment in, in Linux is it goes way back. You know, I think that IBM is working hard, uh, like a lot of larger software companies, to prove their credibility around free software and open source. But it's almost unfair that they have to because they really have been big investors in Linux uh, for, for quite, a, quite a long time. By the way, uh, you have the open source initiative starting uh, around, uh, you know, I think this was 1997, 98. Someone's probably gonna correct me on that. Um, but uh, I wanna point out that this is actually a different movement than the uh, GNU project and the free software movement that we saw really starting out in the late seventies with the Emacs editor. Um, so, you know, just bear in mind that, you know, the, the free software movement uh, did start earlier than what we consider the the open source initiative now, but of course, open source, uh, you know, and and uh, distribution models of, of of doing collaborating on software in an open way, you know, would become the runway for making Linux what it is today. Uh, you then saw, you know, uh, the Debian flavor of Linux grow into this more desktop friendly version called Ubuntu, now owned by the Canonical Corporation. They're kind of a big deal. You've probably heard of them. Uh, Git, uh, also invented by Linus Torvald. Um, if you didn't know that, uh, it's 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 good to know that uh, this guy's really important. You know, I think Git in many ways, um, possibly more important than I don't know what I'm going to say. It's, it's as important as Linux. It is. I mean, what it's done for free software and proliferation of free software, uh, and the ability to spin out into something like GitHub, uh, it's it's as important. Uh, the start of the Linux Foundation, people who actually employ Linus Torvald. And then, of course, you know, moving into to now, you know, we, we see Raspberry Pis, we see Microsoft becoming a huge Linux contributor, building the uh, Linux subsystem for uh, Windows into their operating system. Uh, uh, they have a huge amount of Linux consumption on their Azure cloud. Uh, interestingly, um, you know, I think uh, they, they published, I don't remember when they published it, but Linux pretty quickly outpaced uh, Windows Server as the operating system of choice running on Azure. And then, of course, we have the IBM acquisition uh, recently of Red Hat and then uh, um, this kind of interesting Suzy purchasing rancher, I think, kind of taking their own uh, play at uh, cloud native infrastructure happening uh, pretty recently. So really a long and, and interesting history. Uh, that it that did all start uh, very organically in in the forums of of uh, you know Unix enthusiast forums and and a hobbyist just kind of putting a free operating system out there. Okay, so um, a lot of interesting history there. But why you know why are you here? Why are you you know interested in this? Why why thinking start thinking about developing on Linux? Well, there's really you know a lot of good reasons to do it. First of all, 
very powerful command line and tools. And I know that, you know, it's, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a bold move for me to start with by plugging the command line uh, as for, for, for a lot of folks who may be new to Linux that may seem a little bit uh, unfamiliar or, or, or scary. Um, but it is a lot of what gives Linux its power and its uh, ability to very flexibly remotely administer Linux. So, you know, I don't, I'm not saying day one, you need to start with the command line. Probably shouldn't these days. You, why, why put yourself through it? But you will need to embrace it. You will need to learn it at some point if you really want mastery over your servers and, and mastery over the, uh, uh, the machines that you're controlling. <clears throat> okay. Um, a lot of options for productivity improvement. Uh, so again, you know, scripting, uh, part of the, the power of a command line and part of the, uh, the power of working with something that's just text in a terminal uh, and just relying on freeform text input and output is scriptability, right? Now, I, I realize that we can do macro recordings and stuff like that with GUI environments. But, you know, if you've ever, you know, tried to set that up versus just writing a small script, uh, I think, you know, most of us can probably agree it's easier to write the script and the command line just makes it super easy to do that. Free is in free speech. Okay, so we can modify it, customize it. We can learn from the source code. It's truly community driven. And this is true for all Linux. Okay, as we'll look at the, the actual anatomy and architecture of a, a flavor of Linux in a moment, um, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll see that, that Linux is in fact unified. I mean, you, you do see a lot of different flavors, but everything centers and anchors around a common kernel, which is community software, it's customizable, modifiable. Uh, very easy to prototype uh, things uh, in Linux because it's that flexible. Um, very accurate testing because it's easy to recreate production environments uh, in Linux. There's not, you know, spinning up and spinning down a Linux environment, um, especially a non-licensed Linux environment like CentOS or something like that. Uh, you can, there's no cost in doing that. And so you can, you can start from scratch in your testing environments. And of course, this is happening faster and faster and, and more mature CICD pipelines moving even from VMs into containers where things spin up immediately now. But the point is you, you can, really reduce a lot of your friction in your delivery pipeline uh, because of the ease of spinning up and spinning down fresh environments and recreating the same conditions that you would have in your in your development environment. Uh, natural environment for uh, web technologies like Apache or Nginx that you may be wanting to use uh, as a front end. Um, you do have good options for, for, for security hardening such as SE Linux and and if any of you have heard, oh, SE Linux is, I heard my friend said it's awful and I don't wanna mess with it. That used to be true, it's not true anymore, right? The tooling around SE Linux has really improved and it's a lot easier to work with now uh, and, and really can be the difference between, you know, whether or not your system gets compromised. We've, we've absolutely um, done forensic work with customers who have been, you know, kind of post, uh, post hack and gone in and found out, you know, if you had just enabled SE Linux on this machine, that attack vector wouldn't have been available or something like that. Uh, it did pave the way for this uh, newish world of containers and microservices and, and instant release and, and all the wonderful things that we've been talking about uh, this year at the show. Uh, easy automation uh, through tools like Ansible. Uh, we talked a little bit about, you know, the importance of understanding the command line so that we can do remote administration through SSH. Um, you know, just, you know, if you've, if, you've, if you've worked with Windows servers in the past, and you've had to do, you know, uh, you know, remote desktop clients and stuff like that. When they work, they work. But when you're in low bandwidth uh, situations or when you're you're having problems, it's just, you know, it can be really painful. You can get a lot of lag. It can be really difficult using that type of remote desktop, um, uh, remote desktop uh, administration. But through SSH on this command line, you can be in a low a low bandwidth uh, environment and still have, you know, really good, uh, certainly faster and, and less laggy administration that you would have through, you know, through, through trying to do a shared desktop. And you can, of course, scale to huge sizes without huge license costs. And bottom line, Linux makes you look cool. And that's really why y'all are here. Okay. Uh, it's really good, particularly for web development. Uh, it was the uh, original home of the LAMP stack. Uh, and this is an old picture. Um, but the LAMP stack uh, was, you know, early aughts, early 2000s, kind of like the de facto uh, free software or open source software web stack that was out there. So you would build on a Linux machine, you would throw Apache web server in front of it, you'd use a database, hopefully Postgres and not MySQL, uh, and then you'd throw a PHP or, or some other web language on top of it. Now, believe it or not, this stack has not 
really changed a ton. You know, I mean, we, we, we have different substrates now, you know, we're, we're looking at containers and everything like that, but you know, there's still a lot of PHP out there. Arguably you're starting to see a lot of like Node.js and more just JavaScript driven things, but they're still being hosted predominantly on Linux servers, even if those Linux servers are now like stripped down, you know, core OS containers or something like that. Nginx, we're seeing more of that in our ingress, but it's still just a web server. So, you know, end tier has maybe changed a little bit in our newer world of like distributed and container driven microservice SaaS stuff. Um, but in terms of like the technologies, if you just, you know, didn't use a brand on them or, or didn't use a vendor, they're, they're kind of the same. Uh, great web app prototyping environment, super easy to install across multiple servers, really easy access to error logs, tons of other web platforms available to you easily on Linux. Um, are there downsides to Linux? Sure. Yeah, uh, definitely. I mean, in, in, in the one, on the one hand, I think the reason that you haven't seen a lot of unification uh, onto, you know, like the, like the year of the standard Linux desktop or any of that is that there is just a surfeit of APIs, frameworks, runtimes, tools, all these different things you, you have. I've heard it called the tyranny of choice before. <laughs> um, but you have a, a lot of uh, a ways to create quote Linux apps, right? And, and there have been some attempts at fixing some of this fragmentation, but they haven't really worked out too well, to be honest. Uh, things like snaps weren't very well uh accepted by communities and stuff so what you end up with is what you end up with in a lot of open source which is fragmentation right now uh you know fragmentation has a lot of benefits as well right uh, i mean open source tends to be pretty purpose driven and you know in in some cases this 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 the way this market looks isn't really all that different you're taking several pieces and you're putting them together to make your solution um, you know, if you look at the Android App Store versus the Apple App Store, well, I mean, Android is open source and, and there are tons of different, you know, distributions of Android that go on lots of different bits of hardware. And so sometimes apps don't play nicely. And that's, that is the truth of fragmentation. That's, that's part of having all this choice. And it is a phenomena that you see more and more around open source. Um, you see organizations like Linux Foundation, like Cloud Native Compute Foundation, I think trying to provide some governance and, and uniformity to this, but I think there's always going to be some some necessary fragmentation in this space. But for a lot of people, that can be overwhelming, right? Uh, still an orphan desktop, still waiting on the uh, year of the Linux desktop. Oh, I need to update the slide for for 2020. But um, because of that, uh, still a tiny market share in terms of desktop, mixed UX, difficult installation on some notebooks, but. I mean, to be honest, you know, running a Linux desktop is a, is a wonderful thing. It is. Um, but in terms of your work, right, I mean, mostly people are, are interacting with remote Linux servers or they're working with Linux based Docker containers. Uh, a lot of times, if you're really good with your automation and you're mature with your DevOps, you're not even really interacting directly with the box anymore. You're just using automation uh, tools to hit it. So you know, the, 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 the desktop, although a lot of strides have been taken and there are some wonderful desktop, desktop distributions um, of, of Linux like Pop and, and Linux Mint and stuff like that, still a small market share in comparison with, um, with other, desktop, uh, other desktop platforms. How are we doing on time here? Oh, okay, good. So how do you get started? Well, the first thing you have to do is pick your flavor of Linux. Now, what's a flavor? Well, a Linux itself, a distribution of Linux always starts with what we call the Linux kernel. Okay, so that's kernel.org. You can go look at it. That is the, you know, the maintained source code of Linux for which Linus Torvald is still a moderator uh, of that code, right? When you are committing to Linux, when you're a kernel developer, which is pretty rare, that's, that's the work that you're doing. You're, you're committing to the Linux kernel. All distributions of Linux start with the kernel which is just the basic bit of the operating system that allows you to interact with enough of the machine hardware and enough of the, um, the built-in operating system and all the parts of the computer that you need to be able to interact with to start installing other pieces of software to support the operating system to be able to do more with it, right? So Linux, right, doesn't have like a desktop because Linux is the Linux kernel, right? But you have several desktop projects built on top of Linux that give you a unified UI environment. And then different flavors of Linux, so Ubuntu, Red Hat, Arch Linux, Suzy, they're going to choose or curate various, various bits of supporting software that that community has decided they want to put in their distribution of Linux. And it tends to all be free software. 
tends to all be software that you pull from public package repositories, tends to be really easy to install and consume all of this other free software that, that supports using the, the, the Linux kernel. And it is just that supporting software that really differentiates one flavor of Linux from another. So what, what user experience did the community have in mind? You know, is this built, is this, this distribution of Linux meant for beginners, for instance, or meant for people who just want to use it as an easy desktop environment and may not be like deep Linux enthusiasts, but still want to use Linux, right? And for that, you have, you know, you, you have good options. You have options of Linux that are super stripped down and meant just for like low powered embedded hardware. You have some, you know, stuff that's kind of in the middle. You have flavors of Linux that are meant to reinvigorate your 10 year old laptop. Um, you know, I have, I have a version of Debian running on a 12 year old MacBook and it's still capable of doing basic stuff like watching Netflix or whatever, you know, I mean, it, it still works for that. Um, so, you know, to be a little bit diligent about, you know, what flavor you think is really going to kind of work for you. And the good news is nowadays it's all pretty flexible. You have the ability to any of the mainstream versions, you can preview, uh, you know, how the operating system is going to feel very easily. Uh, you can download what's called a live USB CD where you can actually like run it in a VM right on your Windows machine and play around inside there and make sure that you're, you like it before you choose to install it. You can live boot your machine, uh, you know, so that you're actually your machine is dedicated and running the operating system, but you haven't actually installed it. You're running it all of a, off of a thumb drive. So there's there's a lot of different ways that you can preview. We're going to look at some of that. Uh, but the main differences between these different flavors, the main the real mainstream flavors are like the package management. And what I mean by that is like, how do you install software onto the onto the box? So with Linux, you know, if you're, if you're used to Windows or even Mac to a degree where you have to go and like, you know, go out to the internet and, and grab software and download it and run an installer and install it on your machine. Typically that's not what you're doing in Linux. I mean, there are some bits of software that install that way, but for, for the most part, you're just running like a single command line go grab this piece of software or install it. And then it figures out all the bits and pieces that it needs and it just throws it there and it's just, you just have it. Some of the operating systems too, some of them like, like Ubuntu have taken it a step further to the next logical step and given you a, a graphical, more like app store type of interface to the software. But for the most part, um, uh, package management is how you're going to be installing software. Um, and that's what's gonna define kind of the ecosystem that you're, that you're living in. Um, and so pay attention to that. What, what seems easiest to you in terms of installing software? Um, and then of course the kernel version, I go for, go for the newest possible, more security, better performance, that kind of thing. Pay attention to the community, look for quick releases, uh, look for people who have a fast response to security vulnerabilities. Most of the mainstream ones do, you know, if you start with something like an Ubuntu or a CentOS or Red Hat or something, you're going to get all of these things. Um, there are very focused distributions as well. Uh, such as, for instance, the Kali Linux distribution, which is really good for security professionals. It comes with a lot of curated software that's good for uh, doing penetration testing and scanning and all that good stuff. Uh, but there's pretty much something for everybody. Right? It's just a bunch of different, bunch of different logos, bunch of different flavors. Some of them may look familiar to you. Um, interoperability with with other uh, operating systems is really important when you're getting started here. Um, so you do have the ability to cross compile, uh, and, and some of these, uh, you have cross platform, pl pl excuse me, cross platform frameworks like Java and things like that, which pretty much look the same in both environments. Uh, probably the easiest way to get started if you're on a Mac or you're on windows now is going to be through one of these virtual machine solutions like vagrant, uh, virtual box. I'll show you a, an even easier one in a second, but these are going to effectively allow you to just, uh, uh, run a Linux implementation, full installation, running right on your existing laptop inside your, your current operating system, just to, you know, um, just as a way to, to, to start it, to get in it without having to really commit too much to it. I mean, there are people who do plenty of like full-time work in just Linux VMs on their, you know, on their Macs or on their, their, their Windows machines, which is, which is absolutely fine. Um, but it's a pretty easy way to, to get started with it. Uh, in terms of like, a uh, uh, you know, moving software from one platform to another. Uh, there are some solutions that'll allow you to like run Windows applications on Linux. There's the Wine, which stands for Wine is not an emulator because it's actually like a re-implementation of the underlying uh, shared libraries for, Lin uh, for, excuse me, for Windows and stuff in Linux. Um, and then, you know, file system interoperability. So being able to share files um, between uh, between Linux uh, and, and other types of systems can be achieved through NFS, uh, Samba, 
um, which is a, a free implementation of uh, CIFS, Windows uh, file, <clears throat> file sharing system. Um, most of the stuff uh, that you're used to is going to kind of look the same. Your favorite IDEs and everything in terms of what you might be used to for development have already been ported. You know, up here is uh, Eclipse uh, running inside of Linux. Down here is uh, uh, IntelliJ. Um, I should have put a VS Code picture, but I mean, as you, as you might imagine, VS Code has been ported beautifully to Linux. It works great. Um, and the UX on, on these IDEs is going to be pretty much identical. Um, you got nice editors like Sublime Text and Atom. A lot of these were built, by the way, on Linux first and later ported to um, platforms like Mac, Mac and Windows. I mean, when you start getting into Linux, you really start seeing how big the world of like, you know, consumer free software is. And there, there's a bunch. Um, and a lot of these projects did start as Linux projects that then moved out to commercial operating systems. Um, classic command line editors, Vim, Emacs, Nano, you can edit from the shell. Um, so on your first install, generally the community is going to provide you some type of installation media. Uh, usually this is this is in the form of a bootable ISO. Uh, and so this is kind of flexible, right? With this, you could old school burn a CD <laughs> if, you, if you have a machine that's got a CD drive still. Uh, more commonly, you can burn this ISO to a USB thumb drive uh, and boot to that thumb drive. Or uh, when you start getting into VirtualBox or Vagrant or uh, any of these uh, utilities that allow you to run a virtual machine locally on your on your uh, on your laptop or whatnot, um, they will all have a place where you can fake boot a CD, which they'll ask for this ISO. So this is just kind of the 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 media. You'll be able to configure everything you want: your system, software, network. Uh, choose a theme in some cases. So, for instance, you'll see the next one, CentOS Seven, allows you to kind of choose like what type of environment do you want this Linux to be. From there, uh, once it's installed, you can use the whatever package manager that I mentioned uh, came with the uh, the uh, operating system to install additional software. You can download stuff. You can build stuff from source. Obviously, much easier to do on Linux than other than other platforms. So this is uh, like just an example. This is CentOS 7's you know graphical installer. Okay, so this is not hard, right? I mean, you you're most of this you know it's 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 a pretty friendly installer. CentOS aims to be enterprise class Linux, and that means it shouldn't be super hard or, or weird to use. But I want to kind of point out, like, uh, you know, we have this this interesting, you know, pointing out how 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 flexible our operating system can really be because of the way that it's just the kernel surrounded by a suite of software. Look at how this pre-curated software can determine, you know, even what type of machine you're going to end up with. You want just like a small infrastructure server for just doing like network infrastructure stuff. You want the most minimal base install you could possibly have. Do you want just a basic web server for like a basic web app? Do you want a desktop environment? This is the desktop environment. And this is actually letting you choose between two separate uh, windowing or desktop like environments. So GNOME, which is uh, kind of a popular one that um, which you'll see a picture of in a minute. KDE is another one. Uh, do I want a creative workstation with with graphics? uh applications and all that kind of stuff and then do i want any add-ons so this is really cool right i mean this is where you're getting to kind of pick and choose what you want your final uh operating system to look and feel like and it can be very different based on you know the software that's curated for you a very minimal install it's super stripped down there's no windowing environment at all uh and then something like this is pretty pretty big and, and beefy and feels more like a powerful you know desktop environment and you have that choice and and all of this by the way all of these packages that get pulled in are all free software. They're all open source. I mean, the, 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 you, you, don't you don't have this power and flexibility without free software, which is another great reason to get into Linux is you're just, you're, you're flexing the power of free software in a way that you just, you just don't in other operating systems. Uh, this is a picture of GNOME. Uh, so one of the desktop environments it's expired and inspired by Mac OS. Uh, so it looks a little bit like Mac OS. There's even a dock uh, application available. This is KDE, which is meant to look a little bit more like Windows, so kind of a familiar Explorer type of environment here. And you can just you know, freely install either of these uh, and, and use whichever one you're comfortable with. But you do, at some point, want to embrace the shell. And we're not going to go through all these commands, um, but uh, they're here for you in the slides, uh, which I have to upload still, I think, but I'll make sure that happens. Um, you know, but this is uh, obviously not an exhaustive list. Um, but some of these commands, like doing a directory listing, changing to a different directory, um, you know, uh, DOS was inspired by um, by Unix. And if you've done any work in DOS um, or even PowerShell now, 
you know, some of this shouldn't feel all too different from you, just a different set of commands to do a lot of the same stuff and way more commands and full software packages that live only in the shell. Things like wget, which allow you to go pull websites and website text directly into your command line. So the, the command line is super powerful. And because it's all text driven, you can script it very easily. So do embrace it eventually, but not necessarily today. OK. Um, mm, little overview of the file system here you know our configuration files live in slash etc uh, we have a user directory where we have all of our shareable and uh, stuff that we want to maybe share between users like linux is, and unix is meant to be a multi-user operating system so it is very it has a natural fit uh, for that um, home directories per user live in the slash home and everything in unix and linux is a file like everything you don't have you know, dynamically linked libraries and, and, a, and a registry and, and kind of this concept of like, you know, the way that that resources in your on your machine are accessed happen through all these different vectors or avenues. It's really all through a file, but those files can do a lot of things, right? Those files can be network sockets. Those files can be handles to processes, uh, things like that. So what can you do today? Uh, well, you can go out and play. Uh, you can try installing on bare metal. Um, if you have enterprise hardware, you know, most of the time this stuff is already developed with Linux in mind, it's going to install just fine. Consumer hardware can be a little bit inconsistent. Um, most of the mainstream uh, operating system or most of the mainstream flavors like Mint and, and Ubuntu and things like that uh, have gotten pretty good about consumer hardware, but your mileage may vary depending on how obscure the laptop is or the desktop for that matter. Uh, usually if you build, uh, if you have like an old PC that you've built, and it's on a pretty common motherboard, like common commodity motherboard, you're going to be fine. Um, Grub is a bootloader that allows you to dual boot. You may have heard that term before uh, so that you can, you know, at, when you turn your computer on, you can decide, OK, I want to go into Linux or I want to go into Windows. If you're on Mac and you're used to boot camp, it's, it's kind of the same thing. Uh, Refind is a utility for Mac that lets you dual boot Linux and Mac on the same machine as well. If you want to if you want to run Linux natively on your Mac. Uh, of course, VMs, we kind of talked about that being the easiest way to get started. Uh, this is uh, VMware Fusion running Linux Mint on a Mac, all right? So this is what it looks and feels like. Here is the full operating system. It's kind of like, you know, it's emulated, so it's kind of locked in the matrix. It doesn't really know that it's living in a simulation, right? Um, but it's, uh, it is the full Linux Mint operating system running in here. There are some limitations to running it in a VM. You're going to have to have special hardware extensions if you want to run VMs inside of VMs and special hardware extensions if you want to play with like uh, Kubernetes and stuff like that inside of here. So just kind of be mindful of that. Um, so there are some reasons why you want to run it right on the metal. But this is definitely the best, the, like the easiest way to get started today if you just want to start learning about Linux and start getting going with it. How are we doing on time? About 10 more minutes. Great. Linux also loves containers. Easy to launch containers inside of Linux. Easy to download containers that are certain types of Linux and start playing around inside of them. So you can Docker run a, a CentOS image, for instance, and have a stripped down Docker CentOS image to start playing with. This new one, I love this thing. I just stumbled across this pretty recently. Um, this is handy. Uh, this is a, a universal ISO booter. So I'll show you another one in a second that I've been using in the past specifically for Linux. But what I really like about Ventoy is that whereas the Linux Live Creator that I'll show you in a second only lets you boot um, Linux ISOs, this actually has created its entirely new bootloader uh, and it's totally dynamic. And you can boot any type of boot media from a single USB key. So you can boot Linux ISOs, uh, you can boot Windows ISOs, Mac ISOs if you need to, all off of the same USB key. So super useful and an easy way to get started with Linux. You can just grab yourself like a nice fast USB 3 key and start throwing ISOs onto it and uh, run, have Ventoy format it and start throwing ISOs on it. And you just toss this into any computer and let it boot to the thumb drive. And you can just select whichever ISO you want to boot. So it's super helpful and free and open source. Um, this is the one I used to use before that, though, um, called the uh, Lili or Linux Live uh, USB Creator, which I still really like this for, for creating uh, uh, Linux uh, thumb drives. Uh, it lets you just from a nice, super easy pull down menu, select the flavor of Linux that you want to start playing with. It even lets you launch it in a VM and start you know, messing around with it. It'll save everything that you've done in that VM on the thumb drive. And if you want to boot live, It'll also let you boot live. So you can you know, stick the thumb drive in the computer, 
and uh, boot to it and have the full native Linux, Linux experience and keep everything persistent on the thumb drive. And then if you want to just later, you know, be in Windows or be in Mac and just launch it in a VM, it's the same thing. You launch it in a VM. So very helpful. Uh, Raspberry Pi, uh, another great way to get started with Linux today. Uh, it's a full system in a $35 box. These things are getting powerful. I have the 4B uh, running a, a, a wall board actually in my office. And uh, these things are, are really getting powerful uh, with, with an eight gigabyte now option for them, although more expensive than the $35 box, obviously. But a bunch of uh, Linux builds that are available for uh, Raspberry Pi and a great way to just get started uh, with, with Linux and a fully dedicated machine for a cheap price tag. I mean, just plug it into any HDMI source and throw an old keyboard and mouse in there and you got yourself a full uh, Linux machine environment. All right, and that's really it. Uh, easiest ways to get started. Uh, of course, you can reach out to me. I do like people. I'm happy to, uh, to talk to you if you have any questions or you're running into any issues kind of getting started with the stuff. Uh, hit me up on LinkedIn. There's a QR code down there if you want uh, to scan that. Uh, I do blog about a bunch of stuff uh, as part of my job, so feel free to hit that up. Uh, sometimes there are Linux blogs, sometimes there are other bits of open source. Uh, most recently, um, did a piece on actually AI and ML, uh, and deep networks uh, improving uh, software fuzzing. Right, so it varies a little bit. Uh, feel free to send me an email. All right, so I think we got a few minutes here for questions. Let me go on the Q and A. Looks like we've got four of these. Can you explain GNU's role in Linux and why we should say GNU Linux? Yeah, sure. So um, uh, the Free Software Foundation um, has a different view of uh, open source versus free software. Okay, uh, In the view of the Free Software Foundation, uh, software is only free if it can be uh, if it can be enforced that it'll never be put behind uh, digital rights management or that if it's ever modified uh, and improved from its original that, that those modifications must be shared back to the community or you are in violation of the obligations of that license. Okay. Um, the goal of the Free Software Foundation is different than the goal of the Open Source Initiative. Right? Neither one of them is bad or good, right? Just, just different set of philosophies. You know, free software is really about everyone having access to the source at all times and creating communities that put that are that are obligated to push free software back and they really are into the free as in freedom aspect of that software don't put that software behind drm don't put it in a permissive license where that software can live in, in a non-free way so licensed linux that has now the linux kernel is governed by gpl um, but there's a lot of supporting software, right? What did we talk about? We said that Linux is the Linux kernel and then a suite of supporting software. And there are, um, uh, there, there are certainly organizations that have branded uh, Linux and branded the suite of software that, that lives around it. And the Free Software Foundation basically has said, well, that's not free software. It isn't, right? There's a, there's a non-GPL license governing it. Uh, so they want the free software foundation would prefer for you to say gnu linux which means the truly free uh gpl version of linux running nothing but truly free gpl software none of which is permissive none of which uh could be considered non-free okay so that's 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 where they're 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 uh really sticklers for that and and, and frankly i agree with the free software foundation that that distinction is very important you know, the, the goal of free software is uh, of free software foundation is to kind of change the world through free software. The goal of open source and the open source initiative is to create amazing software using a, a group and, and collaborative model. You see, so they're both very good, right? And, and most open source software is also, excuse me, most free software, like free, free, uh, free software foundation, foundation, free software would be considered open source but not necessarily the other way around by the Free Software Foundation. So if you wanna learn more about that though, um, there is an excellent Free Software Foundation publication, uh, fsf.org called uh, Why Open Source Misses the Point of Free Software. And I know that sounds a little negative um, and, and you know, the FSF kind of beats up a little bit on open software a little bit, but it will at least give you some insight, I think, into, um, it'll give you some insight into uh, uh, why they feel that way. Okay, that's a lot on that question, but it's a big topic and it's a good question. Uh, recommendations. Hey, Justin, for, just, yeah. Just a heads up, Tyler here. Uh, five minutes. I was just going to let you know. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to. No work problem. Through. That was a, that's a big question. And, <laughs> a good one. and I'm, and by the way, uh, hit me up somewhere else later if you want to talk more about that. It's a big, it's a big, uh, big topic. 
Okay, uh, recommendations, resources, best way for beginning to get comfortable with the Linux shell. Uh, great question. Um, I think that the Linux Foundation's uh, Linux administration tutorial set is a really, really good set uh, to start with there. It's not, it's not free. They do charge for the training, but it's pretty reasonable. Um, and, uh, and they just do an excellent job. Um, you know, I think, uh, trying, uh, the, one of the first, one of the first kind of breakthroughs that people have is that like when they're, they're using the, the GUI environment and the terminal next to each other, that they are in fact administering the same machine, right? It's like, it's a, it's an intellectual leap almost. And you have to wrap your head around it for a second. But one thing I like to do is have like, you know, one thing I'll show people in the trainings and stuff you know, have your traditional file window that you'll have in like GNOME or KDE uh, where, where you can see your file system, have that open and then open your terminal to that same directory and just start messing around. Just start like using the touch command to create files and everything like that. Just start getting very comfortable with the, the relationship between the terminal and kind of the rest of the operating system. But, but in, in, you know, command references are very good too. Get used to using the man, M-A-N command, which will uh, give you a nice handy manual on your, in your terminal. Um, make sure you're using a modern terminal emulator because there are some uh, great newer terminal emulators like iTerm, if you're on Mac, for instance, that give you all these great shortcuts inside the environment that make, makes your life easier. Okay. Reason not to use Etcher? Uh, no, I like Etcher. Etcher's fine. Um, I, I really like that Ventoy though because it's more universal. With Etcher, you can only uh, you can only boot a single ISO per USB, so you're like burning the ISO to the USB, and that's all you can do. With Ventoy, you're literally copying a bunch of ISOs onto the USB thumb drive, and you can boot any of them. Okay, so I, I think that's more useful. But no, you can you can use you can use Etcher. No reason not to. Uh, best use case for something like Vagrant. Well. That's changing. It used to be that it was great for just doing local development at your workstation, and it was really easy to just spin up a Linux uh, workstation, and you could even throw some Ansible at it, and you know get you know get it set up. And but I, I, the most recent version of Vagrant now has a cloud deployment uh, functionality, which is really cool. You should go check it out. It's it's a cloud native deployment that says, okay, not only do I want you to Vagrant up my image, but I want you to Vagrant up this image on EC2. So super cool. Okay. Um, so, uh, uh, so I used to say it was really more just like, you know, doing dev stuff, but it looks like they're trying uh, to, to get moved more into the real cloud deployment chain, which would make sense for the rest of the HashiCorp uh, tech that they've got. So I'm um, still probably mostly best for desktop stuff, but I mean, you can deploy right into the cloud now. So go, go check that out. Um, been told it's a lot harder to dual boot windows on a machine that already has Linux. Um, is that true? Um, it can be. It depends on the way that the UEFI bootloader is con is uh, is configured on that machine and that machine's uh, built-in operating system. If it's a if it's a newer one, um, there's probably more flexible options for you in there uh, that'll make it easier for you. Um, but uh, uh, but the the problem is that that Windows has a tendency to overwrite Linux's bootloader. So what you end up having to do is like install Windows and then run Linux recovery to reinstall the bootloader and tell the bootloader to control Windows, all right? Windows' bootloader will not boot a Linux operating system, but the Linux bootloader will boot Windows, all right? So that's why that's out there. Uh, again, if you have trouble, feel free to hit me up. And I think I did it and we only have 10 seconds left and uh, make room for the next speaker. So thanks again for attending. I hope you enjoyed it and uh, enjoy the rest of the show.